Picture this. A whiteout blizzard. Snow slamming sideways. The wind howls like a wolf pack. And yet there stands a single tip eye steady. Alive. Now let me ask you, if you were trapped out here with nothing but a skin lodge, no furnace, no electric heater, could you survive the night? The Lakota, the Crow, and other Plains tribes did exactly that. Century after century, they turned a simple cone of poles and buffalo hide into what I'd call a genius heating system. Not just shelter, survival engineering. Tonight, I'll show you how they kept the fire breathing, how the airflow worked like a chimney, how they beat frostbite when the dew point froze solid, and more important, I'll show you how you can use the very same tricks, whether you're in a hunting camp, an old army tent, or just testing yourself in the backyard during a snowstorm. Stay with me, because the difference between warmth and death is knowing three simple rules. Keep dry, keep the fire, keep the air moving. Now, before we dive into the survival tricks, let's set the stage. When folks hear the word native shelter, they often picture a teepee. But here's the truth. The teepee was not universal. Out east, the Iroquois lived in longhouses, massive wooden halls that could hold entire families. Up north, along the Missouri, the Mandan built earth lodges, solid domes of timber and sod, warmer, but fixed in place. The teepee, though, that belonged to the Great Plains. Tribes like the Lakota, the Blackfoot, the Crow. Wide open prairies, no trees for lumber. Brutal blizzards sweeping across flat land. Out there, the teepee wasn't just a choice. It was survival engineering tailor-made for the plains. And here's the kicker. Before horses came, teepees were smaller, only what dogs could drag on a travoy. Families packed tight fire in the center, hides pulled close. After horses arrived in the 1700s, suddenly you could haul bigger poles, more buffalo hides. Tippus grew taller, sturdier, and more comfortable to ride out a storm. That's technology shifting with the times. But don't think this was just men's work. No. Women were the architects of the teepee. They set the poles, stitched the hides, lined the floor with insulation of grass and skin. They managed the smoke flaps, adjusting them with a tug of rope, just like tweaking the damper in your old wood stove. The men, their job was to hunt the bison, bring home the hides and meat to keep the family alive. Two roles, both essential, both respected. Picture it, women tugging at the flap as the wind changes men hauling frozen buffalo into camp. Children huddled close by the fire, the whole structure alive, breathing with the storm. And here's what I want you to take away. The tippy was not some one-size-fits-all tent. It was the plains people's answer to the cold, the wind, the whiteout blizzard. A masterpiece of airflow, insulation, and mobility. If you tried to use a longhouse in the middle of Dakota winter, you'd freeze. If you hauled an earth lodge across the prairie, you'd never move it. But a teepee that stood tall shed snow like a mountain peak and could be packed up when the herds moved. That's the lesson. Every landscape demands its own shelter. And the teepee. It was the ultimate design for the storm-beaten plains. All right, let's talk about the physics of the teepee. First, the shape. That cone. It wasn't just pretty. It was built to fight the storm. A blizzard slams into flat walls, but against a cone, the wind breaks and slides. Snow piles on a cabin roof till it caves in. On a tippy, it slides right off, just like water rolling off a duck's back. Next, the smoke hole and those adjustable flaps. This was pure genius. Picture it, cold air sneaks in low, warm smoke, climbs high, and the flaps guide it out. That's air flow and natural chimney effect. The Lakota didn't use the word dew point, but they knew what happened when moisture froze. By keeping the fire breathing and the air moving, they cut down condensation, cut down frostbite. And then the floor. You didn't sleep on frozen dirt. They lined it with buffalo hides and dry grass. That's insulation. It stopped ground moisture from creeping up and turning your bedding into ice. Modern campers might toss down a foam pad or soldiers roll out an army mat. Same principle. Stop the dew point under your back. You save your heat. 
you save your life. Put all that together, and the teepee was no primitive hut. It was an engineered heating system, every line of it designed to work with the wind, the fire, and the snow. Think about it. A tippy in a Dakota blizzard was like a submarine under the sea. You survived because the system was airtight, balanced, always breathing. Miss one detail, let the flap sag, let the fire die, skip the floor, insulation, and the cold would eat you alive. And here's the payoff. If you're out in an army tent today or testing gear in your backyard snowstorm, the same rules apply. Shape matters. Airflow matters. Insulation matters. Keep dry. Keep the fire. Keep the air moving. Remember those three and you're already walking in the footsteps of the Crow elders who still teach these lessons when the wind shifts on the plains. Now, imagine you're inside the tippy, the blizzard pounding outside. First rule, the fire never sleeps. Among the Lakota, the Crow, even up with the Blackfoot, there was always a fire watch. Someone stayed awake, feeding the coals, nudging the logs, making sure the smoke kept crawling out through the flap like a snake. Why? Because if the flame died, the airflow died. And if the airflow died, smoke built up and you could suffocate before the cold even got you. Second layering. Families wrapped in buffalo hides piled heavy robes over children stacked bedding like armor. The heat from the fire might rise and fall, but the insulation kept the frostbite at bay. It's the same idea you and I use today. Army wool blankets, down bags, or even a cheap sleeping bag doubled up. Fire warms the air, but insulation saves the body. Third, snowbanks. People forget this trick. In a blizzard, they'd shovel snow up around the base of the teepee. That packed wall of frozen powder acted like insulation and a windbreak. Strange, isn't it? Using snow to fight snow. But ask any reindeer herder or a soldier who's dug in with a poncho lean-to. The white stuff can keep you warmer than bare wind. Picture the scene, the wind slamming into the tippy like waves against rock. Kids bundled tight women adjusting the flap ropes, men stoking the fire. Huddled together, trading stories, keeping watch. Breath freezing in their beards, yet alive because the system worked. And here's your takeaway. Survival wasn't luck. It was routine. Fire watch. Layering. Snowbank walls. Three habits that kept families alive when the dew point froze solid. And those same habits will keep you alive in an army tent, a nylon dome, or a backyard tarp when the storm blows in. Remember this, say it out loud if you have to keep dry. Keep the fire. Keep the air moving. Those three rules are the backbone of winter survival. They worked for the Plains tribes 300 years ago. They'll work for you tonight. All right. Let's get practical. When the blizzard hits, survival isn't theory. It's habit. And habits come down to a few do's and a few don'ts. Do. Number one, adjust the flaps with the wind. The Lakota and the Crow knew this like second nature. Pull the rope the wrong way and smoke curls back down, choking the family. Pull it the right way and the airflow works like a chimney cold air in low smoke out high. Think of it as tuning a wood stove damper. If you're in an army tent today, same deal. Vent it right, or you'll cough your lungs out before frostbite ever touches you. Do. Number two, dig a drainage trench. When snow melts around the fire, water runs. If it creeps under your bedding, it kills your insulation. A few minutes with a stick or a bone tool saved lives. Today, grab a boot heel or a folding shovel, same trick. Keep the floor dry, you keep your heat. Now the don'ts. First, don't build your fire too big. In a teepee, a roaring fire doesn't keep you warm, it drowns you in smoke. The old timers kept it small, steady breathing. Fire too hot means condensation on the poles, frost raining down on your face. Second, don't sleep against the outer hide. That skin wall feels solid, but it bleeds cold like an ice block. Folks who pressed too close woke up with frostbite. That's why bedding was pulled toward the center near the fire line layered thick. Remember walls keep out the wind, but they don't love you back. And here's the mini payoff. These little choices flap or no flap, trench or no trench, fire, big or small, bedding, close or far. They were the line between warmth and death. 
the line between a family waking to tell stories or not waking at all. So take it from the elders. Keep dry. Keep the fire. Keep the air moving. The do's and don'ts are simple, but they're not optional. They're survival. Now let me bring this closer to home. I once spoke with a veteran years back who rode out a blizzard in an old army tent. Canvas walls, straight poles, no flaps to guide the smoke. He said the fire kept choking him out. Smoke rolled low, stung his eyes, burned his throat. He couldn't keep the airflow right. And by morning, the whole crew woke up coughing gear, damp frost forming inside. They made it, but barely. Compare that to the way the Lakota or the Crow managed a teepee. Adjustable flaps at the top angled like wings pulling smoke up and away. The whole shelter breathing with the storm. That difference between fighting your tent or letting your lodge work with you, that's the difference between misery and survival. And it's not just old stories. Up north, the Sami reindeer herders still teach the same principles snow shelters and tents that vent, not trap. They know airflow saves lives. And on the Crow Reservation today, elders still gather the young ones, showing them how to set poles, how to tug the flap rope when the wind shifts. It's not nostalgia, it's living knowledge, passed down because it works. Picture it the old soldier squinting through smoke in his army tent. And across time, a crow elder pulling the flap rope with steady hands. Two worlds, same blizzard. One struggling, one flowing with the wind. And here's your mini payoff. Survival wisdom is never stuck in the past. It's alive as real as the frost on your beard or the snow piling against your wall. The typees of the plains, the tents of soldiers, the shelters of herders, they all prove the same thing. Firewatch. Airflow, insulation, those three rules don't age, they don't fail. So next time you pitch a tent in winter, backyard hunting camp, or high country, ask yourself, am I fighting the storm or am I working with it? That's the line that keeps you warm. All right, so how does this play out for you right now in the 21st century? Let's borrow a page straight from the Lakota and Crow playbook and tweak it with some modern gear. First liners. Back then, families hung a second canvas wall or extra buffalo hides inside the teepee. That trapped a layer of air insulation that kept warmth in frostbite out. Today, you can rig a second liner of canvas or even bubble wrap from the hardware store. Doesn't look pretty, but that dead air space is pure survival science. Second, hot water bottles. They didn't have Nalgene in the 18th century, but they did heat stones, wrap them, and tuck them under bedding. You can do the same with a metal canteen or a water bottle. Slip it under your blanket and it'll bleed heat for hours. That's energy storage, plain and simple. Third, reflective surfaces. The Plains tribes had buffalo hide, thick, heavy, great insulation. You grab a cheap mylar blanket or even aluminum foil tacked inside your tent wall. Reflect the heat back, cut down, radiant loss. It's not tradition, but the principle, exact same. And don't forget ventilation. Adjustable flaps made a tippy breathe with the storm. You need to give your tent or shack the same lungs. Crack a vent, cut a low gap, let the smoke snake out, and fresh air slide in. Without airflow, you trade frostbite for suffocation. So here's your mini payoff. You leave this video not with history trivia, but with a checklist. Liner for insulation. Hot bottle under the blanket. Reflective barrier for radiant heat. Ventilation always. These aren't museum pieces. They're survival hacks you can test tonight in your garage tent, in your off-grid shack, or on the edge of deer camp. Remember, keep dry, keep the fire. Keep the air moving. That's the heartbeat of winter survival. From the buffalo hides of the plains to bubble wrap in your backyard, same fight, same rules. So here's where we end our journey tonight. The tippy wasn't just a shelter. It was proof of human ingenuity. The Lakota, the Crow, the Blackfoot. They turned poles and hides into a breathing system, a system that worked with the storm, not against it. And that deserves our respect. Remember this line because it's as true today as it was 300 years ago. The blizzard shows no mercy, but those who understand wind and fire will live through the night. You can carry that wisdom into your own camp. 
Whether it's a nylon tent on a hunting trip, an army surplus canvas, or just a tarp in the backyard, snow follow the same heartbeat. Keep dry, keep the fire, keep the air moving. And I want to hear from you. Did you ever spend a night in a frozen tent? Maybe in your army days, maybe as a kid scout. How did you keep warm? Share your story in the comments. I'd love to hear the tricks that kept you alive.